Hilchais Ma'acholais Asurais Perek Shlishi, The Laws of Forbidden Foods, Chapter 3. You can see here the Ramam's tremendous uh, order. Starts off with the differentiating signs between kosher and non-kosher species. Yesterday we talked about eating the flesh of all the different non-kosher species, fish, birds, animals. Today the Ramam moves on to products. Products of kosher and non-kosher species. Eggs, milk, etc. We're going to get into the discussion today about Chal of Yisrael, why some communities keep to it, some communities don't. We'll talk all about it. So the Rambam begins, Halacha Aleph. Any food which comes from a forbidden species, which you would be liable to lashes for it. So that food is also forbidden to be eaten biblically. Kegoin, chalev behema v'chaya atmeim, like the milk of a non-kosher animal or beast, ubeitze oif v'dog atmeim, and the eggs of a non-kosher fish or bird. How do we know this? Shanemar, because it says in the list of non-kosher birds, it says ve'es bas hayano, and the daughter of the ostrich. Why not just say the ostrich? All the other birds are given by name. How come by the ostrich it says the daughter of the ostrich? Zubetzasa. So the Talmud says, what's the daughter of the ostrich? It's, it's egg. That's the picture on the screen of the ostrich and its eggs. The ostrich is huge, so you don't appreciate how big the eggs are, but the eggs are really, really big. And once we have it in one place in the Torah, so we learn from there that the same law applies to anything which is prohibited, like an ostrich, or and anything similar to an egg, like milk, other products are also forbidden. However, human milk is permitted to be eaten. Even though the flesh of a human being, as we learned yesterday, is forbidden to be eaten, which we explain, it's a lesser prohibition. It's only prohibited by a positive commandment, not by a negative commandment. The milk, though, is permitted. But we'll soon see under what conditions it's permitted. What about honey? Honey that comes from bees or from hornets says the Rambam Mutter, that's permitted. Because scientifically we know, honey doesn't come from, or it's not a product of, their bodies. They gather the pollen from the grasses or from the flowers in their mouth. And they spit it out into the hive. So they can have it ready, available, to eat from in the rainy season. So, it's not a product of something non-kosher. The bees simply bring it from place to place. The hornets, though, the Ammam says it's also permitted. There's a bit of an argument about that. Some say that hornets do involve their own products in their honey, and therefore they would say it's forbidden. But the Ammam says it's permitted. Halacha dalid, afal pisha chalev adam mutter, even though we just said that human milk is permitted to be eaten, asru chachamim legadol linag oisem in ashadayim. The sages forbade any adult to nurse the milk directly from the breast, directly from the breast. The woman could express her milk into a container, into a vessel, and then the person can drink from it. An adult who nurses from the breast is like you're nursing from a non-kosher insect. That's how disgusting it is. And the sages have the authority to give him rabbinic lashes. That's if you're an adult. What if you're a baby? An infant can nurse and keep on nursing directly from the breast for even four or five years. The imgam luhu, if he was weaned, upeira shleishayamim mayaser, and he stopped nursing for at least three days or more, machmas burya le machmas chalyay, in a state of health, not because he was sick, healthily weaned off of nursing, then ene chayzer v'yaynik, you don't have permission. Once you pass the three day threshold, you cannot go back to nursing. Provided he was weaned after 24 months of age. Even if he was weaned, he took a break for a month or two. He can go back and keep on nursing until the end of 24 months. In other words, basically the way you look at it is, for the first 24 months of his life, nursing is totally permitted no matter how long of a break you take. After 24 months, if you take a break, you got to stop. If you don't take a break, you can go to four or five years. Even though the milk and the eggs of non-kosher animals or birds are forbidden biblically, we don't get lashes. In other words, we found a scriptural source for the prohibition, but we don't have a source for punishment. Because here's what it says when it describes the non-kosher meat. 
It says in the verse, You shall not eat from their flesh. And that's the verse that talks about punishment. Only the one about eating from the flesh, which means, You get lashes for the flesh, but not for eggs or milk. The one who does eat eggs or milk is treated like like somebody who eats half of the requisite amount. Yesterday we learned that to, in order to get lashes for eating non-kosher meat, it's not just you eat a tiny bit and you get lashes. You have to eat at least an olive-sized portion. What if you eat less than that? That's called chatsi shir, half the amount, which is shu asr It's forbidden biblically. You don't, you don't get punished. So here too, eating eggs or milk is treated the same way. It's like eating half of an olive-sized portion of meat, biblically forbidden, but you don't get lashes. The rabbis, though, could give you rabbinic lashes if they want. Yerai Ali says the Rambam. It appears to me, this is the Rambam's novelty. If you're going to eat fish, of an, uh, eggs of a non-kosher fish, excuse me, that are found in their st- stomach, it's still in their system, it hasn't been released yet. We're going to treat the eggs as eating the innards of a regular non-kosher fish, and you are going to get lashes if you eat the requisite amount, because while it's in the fish's body, it's considered part of its body. Similarly, if you eat the eggs of a non-kosher bird that are still hanging in the cluster, that's an expression for they're still attached to the spinal cord of the bird. They haven't been released yet, they haven't been laid. They haven't yet separated, they haven't yet become complete. Here too, one who eats these eggs in their unfinished state gets lashes like somebody who would eat the innards of a non-kosher bird. And this actually is proven, the commentaries note, from later on in a couple of chapters, that Imam's going to explain that when it comes to the laws of meat and milk, these eggs, as they're unfinished in the chicken, are considered to be meat. So from the fact that they're considered to be meat with regards to meat and milk prohibition, that shows you they're part of the animal. And therefore you would get, it's actually more strict. While it's attached to the animal's body, you would get lashes as if you're eating non-kosher meat. Halacha ches, beitzas oif tamei, shehischil ha'efrayach lihisrakimba. You have an egg of a non-kosher bird, where the embryo, the chick, is beginning to take form. Ba'achala, and you ate it. So it's no longer an egg in the classic sense. It's already almost having a life of its own. So the Rambam says, mishum eichel you, will, you will get lashes for it, not because it's an egg, but because you're eating a flying insect. In other words, the chick, before it's hatched, has the halachic definition of a flying insect. Avol beitza sa'if toher. Shehischel ha'efreyach lihisrakim ba'achala. But on the other hand, if it's a kosher egg, so a chicken laid an egg, but the chick begins to form in the egg. Now, it's not fully kosher anymore. It has the halachic definition also in some ways of an insect. And therefore, if you ate it, if you ate it, we're going to give you rabbinic lashes. Not biblical, because it isn't non-kosher, but the sages compared it to a non-kosher egg that's also in the middle of hatching, gave it somewhat of the status of a sheretz, and therefore, if you eat it, you're going to get rabbinic lashes. Yeah, but not In the shell. And you open it up and eat it. It hasn't been checked. But so that, that, that's the question. The question is, it's, it hasn't been fully formed yet. What level does it have? So here we, we, don't, we actually don't treat it like a full-on chick. We treat it like a insect. insect exactly. If you have an egg that was fertilized, and you open it up and you find a blood spot on it, which basically means in some form that the, the life inside it has begun to take shape. If you find the blood spot on the white of the egg, you can throw away the blood and eat the rest. That's not considered a full life having begun to take form. If it's on the yolk, then it is forbidden. Because that means that the chick has already begun to form and it's, it's out. An unfertilized egg. The Rambam says in his times, only refined people would eat it because it had a look of a spoiled egg. It had to be a certain character to eat the eggs. I mean, of course, today, most commercial eggs are not fertilized either. So we, we, totally stay, we totally stay away from it. But the Ramam's times, it was considered like taking a risk. You had to be like a... Refined means like you had to be a certain character to, to eat this egg. Which, by the way, the fact that most eggs today are unfertilized has led many rabbinic authorities to be lenient with blood spots on eggs. Because the whole prohibition of a blood spot on an egg is because you say that now the chick is getting its life. But if they're all unfertilized and they cannot become uh, a chick, 
yes, so the blood would have to be considered of a lesser status. Nevertheless, we, we rule, I think it's accepted today that to be you know, strict, strict and just throw it out, but there is room to be lenient, that's what I'm saying. Halacha yut, efroyach shenoylat, once a chick is born, even if its eyes haven't opened yet, but it's hatched out of the chick, out of the egg, mutter la'achle, at this point, it's permitted to eat it. The hema, of course, by the way, you have to slaughter it. The hema, if a kosher animal becomes a trefa, it gets a wound, and it's not going to live for the next 12 months, fascinatingly, its milk now becomes forbidden like the milk of an non-kosher animal, because it won't live. Same thing with an egg of a kosher bird, which became a trefa, is not going to live. It's treated like a non-kosher egg, and it's forbidden. What if an, a bird that was a trefa, terminally ill, laid an egg, and the egg hatched? It turned into a, a live chick. Mutter. Now it's permitted. Because it's a kosher species, after all. Even if, while it was an egg, you weren't allowed to eat it because its mother was terminally ill, now that it's taken on a life of its own, it's permitted. What if you have a bird that got a wound which puts it in a doubtful status. You're not sure if it's a trefa. And we'll explain these in the next set of laws at length. So now that Amram says, you have to kind of stay in limbo. All the eggs that it lays in its first batch, you keep them on the side. Delay them. And you watch what happens to the bird next. We have a tradition, according to the sages, that a bird that's a trefa will not lay more than one batch that it's currently carrying. So you see what happens. If it begins to carry a second batch and lay the second batch of eggs, now the first eggs have become permitted, because if it were indeed terminally ill, it wouldn't give birth or wouldn't lay more eggs. But if it doesn't produce a second batch, now you know the first batch is its last one and those eggs are also forbidden. We have a factual rule. The milk of a non-kosher animal will not solidify. It will not coagulate like the milk of a kosher animal. It cannot turn into cheese. Such that even if you mixed non-kosher and kosher milk, when you solidify it to make cheese, only the kosher milk will curdle and all the non-kosher milk will be expelled with the whey of the cheese that's becoming from the kosher milk. So, keeping that in mind, says the Ramah, logic would dictate, therefore, that any milk that an idol-worshipping Gentile is holding on to should be forbidden. Perhaps he mixed into it non-kosher milk. However, cheese, this is logic would dictate, cheese that's found by a goy should be totally permitted. Because the only way he could have made it is from kosher milk. Because the milk of a non-kosher animal will not solidify. So what does he have left? Only kosher milk to have made the cheese. That's the, the logic. However, in the days of the sages, of the Mishnah, Gazru al Gvina so Ibda Kechavim Mamazales Vasru. The sages came out with a decree against the cheese of idol worshiping Gentiles, and they forbade them. Not because they may come from non kosher milk, but because you need to have a starter to get the milk to curdle. And while it could come, the starter could come from rennet, which is in the in the kosher milk, but it can also be uh, drawn out from the digestive organ of any animal. Stomach lining of an animal, because those also have the same enzymes as, uh, as regular rennet from milk. So therefore, said the, said the sages, oh, maybe the non-Jews used the digestive organs of a non-kosher animal as a catalyst to make their cheese. They may have curdled the cheese in the skin of uh, the stomach lining of an animal slaughtered by them, which is really considered an avela, like a dead carcass. And that non-kosher entity may be mixed into the cheese, thereby making the whole cheese non-kosher. Now, one second. The Imtaymar, you may tell me, the stomach lining being used is so small and minuscule, the chal of sha'amad by compared to the milk, which it's being used to start. So why does it not become nullified in its minority? We have a basic rule, and we're going to explore this at length in the end of these laws, 
that biblically forbidden substances become battle, become nullified, just by being in a majority over them. One in two becomes nullified. Even rabbinically, one in 60 becomes nullified when taste can no longer transfer. Think about, you know, this is, here's a commercial cheese-making situation. You, this is tons of cheese. You put in a little bit of stomach lining, it's for sure. The ratio of 1 to 60 is, is probably much more. So why is it not nullified? It says that I'm, I'm a rule we're going to explore later. Because it is what causes the whole cheese to curdle. Mamid means it causes it to stand. Basically, the whole thing is based on this starter. Since it's a forbidden substance, which caused the whole thing to start, everything is going to be forbidden, as will be explained in chapter 9. and chapter 16, we're going to explore these laws in detail. And therefore, the tiny stomach lining will forbid the whole cheese. Now, Halacha Yudalit says that Ambam, what if you're sure that there was no non-kosher agent in the cheese? Cheese that was curdled by idol-worshipping Gentiles with herbs or with fruit juices, like fig sap, and you can see them in the cheese. In other words, you can know by looking at the cheese that it was curdled not with a non-kosher agent, but with a kosher one. Some of the goinim said that it's still forbidden. Because the sages decreed, and it's a, it's a, it's a blanket decree on the cheese of the idol-worshipping Gentiles. Whether practically they use the non-kosher agent or a kosher one to curdle it, as a decree because of the case where they do use the forbidden agent to curdle it. And therefore, we don't want to, we don't want to stay away from all, uh, yeah, from all, all types. You would never know if they used it. They, they said they used it. I mean, even if you could see it, they, who knows if they used it. Yeah, but they also put in something else. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If somebody eats, goes against this decree, and he eats the cheese made by or in the possession of idol-worshipping Gentiles, or you eat the milk that was milked by an idol-worshipping Gentile with no Jews supervising, the sages will give you rabbinic lashes. What about the butter of these Gentiles? Some Ga'inim say it's permitted. Because they never decreed over butter. The sages' decree was only over cheese. <coughs> and the basic fact that the milk of an unkosher animal will never curdle stands. So for butter, we could use it as a, as a permission. But some of the ga'inim said, no, butter is still forbidden. Because there are drops of milk that will remain, doesn't fully mix into the butter. And those could be non-kosher milk. The way that remains in the butter doesn't mix fully with the butter to the point that we could say that maybe it's nullified in its minority. It, it'll stand and it'll be identifiable. And maybe that comes from non-kosher milk. Because we have a rule. All milk in the possession of Gentiles. We're worried maybe there's some non-kosher milk mixed in. And therefore the butter would be forbidden. As a matter of fact, today, all of this is forbidden, um, definitely by most authorities, since Chol of Yisrael is so easily accessible. We should, make, we, we, we sh- we should do our best to, uh, to access them. It says the Rambam Yeroeli, it seems to me, A Jew buys butter from an idol-worshipping Gentile, Ubishla, and he cooks the butter, till all the drops of milk evaporate, then it would be permitted, even according to the Ga'inim who forbid it. Because either way, if you say the milk mixed in and was cooked with the rest of the butter, now they are nullified in their, in their minority. And if there was no, no milk at all to begin with, well, then it's for sure kosher. But if the idol worshiping Gentiles themselves cooked the butter, that doesn't work for a different reason. That's forbidden because of the cooking done by Gentiles, which is itself forbidden because they, in their vessels there's going to be absorptions of non-kosher food which will exude into the food that you're eating now. It's a different problem. So therefore, the only way to permit it would be if a Jew would cook it. A Jew sits down next to the herd, the flock of a guy. Comes the guy and brings him milk from the herd. Even though in the flock 
there's a non-kosher animal, it is a mutter, the milk is permitted. Even if the Jew didn't directly see the non-Jew milking. It's provided that he could technically see the milking had he stood up. Because the non-Jew would be afraid to milk from the non-kosher animal, lest the Jew stand up and see him. The commentaries point out, though, that the non-Jew has to be aware of the prohibition of non-kosher milk. If he's unaware, then he'll just do his thing. And he may end up milking from a non-kosher, uh, non-kosher animal. So here's where you get into the whole discussion of, t- of Chal of Yisrael today, because typically, by basic Jewish law, based on this, any milk that was not supervised by a Jew is literally non-kosher. The only reason that, we, that people eat what's called Chal of Stam, which, which, which there was no directly a Jew uh, watching the milking process is because of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein wrote a famous response where he says that because of the government supervision or the government level of involvement in the process, it's impossible that a non-Jew would end up milking from a different non-kosher animal bringing it into a plant that's supposed to be producing only kosher products, let's say. So based on that, he was what's called the Chalava companies, the companies milk in which there's lesser reason to be, to be stringent. And based on this is what all the communities today have adopted it. But first of all, many rabbis never agree with, with Hermesha. And also, many, many um, communities today have access to Chal of Yisrael milk or Chal of Yisrael cheeses. And that's for sure a preference. So that's why it's, uh, it's super important that if you can, you do keep Chal of Yisrael. Yud Ches. Let's move back to eggs. Beitza sheshnei rasha kadin or sheshnei rasha kadin. If an egg, both of its heads are pointed or rounded. Kosher eggs have one, one edge is pointed, one edge is rounded. What if it's both pointed or both rounded? Or the yolk was on the outside and the white was on the inside. You can know for sure this is the egg of a non-kosher bird. If one edge is rounded, one edge is pointed. The white is on the outside, the yolk is in the inside. Now you're in the gray. It could be a non-kosher egg, it could be a kosher egg. Therefore, you must sell the Jew, ask the Jewish hunter who's selling it to you. If he tells you it's from this bird, he names the species, and it's a kosher bird, now you can rely on him, as the commentaries explain, because you can compare. He tells you it's chicken eggs, you'll go to a store that has chicken eggs, and you'll see if it's the same thing. But if Ali says, listen, it's a kosher bird, trust me, he doesn't give you the name, you can't rely on him, because maybe if you found the bird that he's talking about, maybe it would be non-kosher, and you, know, you, you wouldn't know to compare. Lefichach, therefore, for this reason, you cannot buy an egg from a non-Jew. Unless you recognize the eggs. And your eye recognizes that they are the eggs of a certain bird that's kosher. Once you know it's a kosher species, you don't have to worry that maybe the eggs that the guy is selling you are coming from a uh, bird which is terminally ill or, uh, or, or died, in which case it is, it is not kosher. No, you can assume it's the majority. But uh, scrambled eggs, you call them, I guess, like, basically once they've been taken out of the shell and mixed, that you cannot buy from a non-Jew at all. Eggs in a fish. Their signs are like the signs of regular bird eggs. If both of their edges were rounded or pointed, it's non-kosher. If one is rounded, one is pointed, you must ask the Jew who's selling. If he says, I salted them. I got them out of a kosher fish. They used to salt in those days fish eggs because they would transport them from far places. So he says, I, I, I oversaw the process. I salted them. I took them out of a kosher fish. You can eat it based on his word. But if all he says is, it's kosher eggs, kosher fish eggs, then you don't believe him. Unless he's a man who has a reputation, he's, he's known to be kosher. If you have cheese or a piece of fish that has no sign of kosher, all the skin's been taken off or whatever, you cannot buy it Unless from a Jew who has a reputation of being kosher. In Israel, when most Jews were observant, in Israel, you can buy from any Jew. But only those days. Milk can be bought from any Jew in any place. One who pickles, non-kosher fish, the brine is also forbidden. 
Aval Tzir Chagavim Tmeim Mutter, but the brine of non-kosher locusts is actually permitted. Because the locusts don't have moisture, doesn't transfer any moisture into the brine. Lefichach, therefore, ain't like chintzir. You cannot buy brine from a non-Jew. Unless there was a kosher fish floating in it, even one fish, because that would show that it was kosher fish that were brined, pickled in this brine. An idol worship Gentile brings a trough, and it's full of open brine barrels. One of the open barrels has one kosher fish. Kulan mutaris, they're all permitted. As the commentaries explain, since they're all open, they become like one entity. And if there's one fish floating in one, they're all permitted. But if they were closed, now they cannot be considered one entity. And the only way to presume that they're all kosher is if you do the following. If you open one barrel and there's a kosher fish floating in it, and a second barrel also has a kosher fish floating in it, then kulen mutares, then they're all permitted, because then you can assume if two are kosher, the rest are all kosher. And that's only if the head and the backbone, the spine of the fish, are there. In which case you can recognize that it's a kosher fish. Therefore, you cannot buy crushed heads of fish or crushed fish in general from, not, from, from non-Jews. That's called the, the mixed taris. This Ramam explains elsewhere that it was like a, like a dip. They would grind fish and, and, and crush it to a very, very, uh, yeah, like a, like a pasty texture. And it was used for a dip. So here you can't see the head, you can't see the backbone, so it's not kosher, assumed to be, and you can't buy it from a non-Jew. But if you could see the head and the spinal cord, even if the rest of the body is crushed, or even if the head itself is crushed, but you can see what it is, and you can buy it from an idol worship Gentile, no problem. If an idol worship Gentile brings to the market um, a keg, or you know, just a bunch of evenly cut pieces of fish, they all look the same, in which case you can see that they're all from one fish. And if you find on one of them scales, since they all look the same, and they all probably came from the same fish, now they're all allowed. Because one has a scale, the rest are probably from the same fish, which is also kosher.